Ladies and gentlemen, the chairman of the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee of the United States Senate, Senator Marco Rubio, accompanied by the chairman of the Council of the Americas, Andres Gluski. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. What a fantastic conversation that was between Michelle and, and President Nayib uh, Bukele of El Salvador. It was really uh, inspiring from the new generations of leaders in, our, in the continent. So we have a terrific agenda for the rest of the day. Uh, I'm Andres Gluski. I'm the chairman of the Council of the Americas. Uh, my day job is I'm CEO for the AS Corporation. So we're going to give the chairman's award. The Chairman's Award is the highest honor that the Council of the Americas bestows. It is awarded to democratically elected leaders with a record of significant achievement in hemispheric affairs. Previous recipients have come from all walks, U.S. and foreign officials, Senate and House members, Republicans and Democrats. What unites them all is an unwavering commitment to a prosperous, competitive, free, and open societies in the Western Hemisphere. I would like to take a moment to draw special, atten special attention to remember a previous recipient, was Senator Richard Luger of Indiana, who recently passed away on April 28th. Senator Luger was a co-recipient of this award in 2011, along with his Senate colleague, Bob Menendez, for his long-standing commitment to the values of the Council of the Americas. Senator Luger, his legacy, and his family are close in our thoughts today. The Council of the Americas and its members share a common commitment to economic and social development, open markets, the rule of law, and democracy throughout the hemisphere. These are the conditions that allow business to thrive and societies to prosper. And it is because of the steadfast support of these principles that we honor this year's recipient. Perhaps no member of the United States Congress has been as outspoken against the assault on democracy and human rights that is taking place in Venezuela as Senator Marco Rubio. As a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he has introduced sweeping legislation to address the humanitarian crisis and the collapse of society in Venezuela and elsewhere in the hemisphere where democratic values are challenged. He chairs the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee and routinely convenes expert hearings that inform the levers of government of how to strengthen the institution of hemispheric democracy. He provides key counsel to the White House, the State Department, and other executive agencies on regional policy. His guidance and leadership on these issues is underpinned by his strong belief that authoritarian governance in any nation is contrary to the best interests of the Americas. Marco Rubio is now the senior senator from Florida. He was elected to the Senate in 2010. He began his career as a city commissioner for West Miami. He was elected to the Florida House of Representatives in the year 2000 and speaker of Florida's House in 2006. It is my great honor to bestow the 2019 Chairman's Award for Leadership in the Americas to the United States Senator from Florida, the Honorable Marco Rubio. Thank you so much. Where's the camera? <laughs> I think these, this is my bio, Not, it's pretty good. It's a, it's a, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Chairman, for that, for this warm introduction. It's an honor to be back with you. I think I was, what was I, two years ago? Two and a half years ago, three years ago, but I'm grateful to receive, receive this award um, and to follow in the distinguished footsteps of some of the previous recipients. Quiero dar la bienvenida a todos que se encuentran acá. Yo no sé el español muy bien, pero hablo cubano perfecto. Así que... 
thank you. Uh, I also want to thank Eric. Thank you, uh, Eric Farnsworth, for the work you do to raise awareness of the various challenges that the hemisphere is confronting, and obviously a topic that's been on everyone's mind, the, the crisis in Venezuela. I'll talk about that more in a moment. A very significant uh, gathering at a moment ago to speak briefly to the Vice President of Colombia, Marta Lucia Ramirez, and, and uh, obviously such an important and key partner to the United States, but, but such a key player in the region and a reminder of what sustained efforts can lead to in terms of bringing about not just democracy, but, but stability in a region. And it, it's great to see the president-elect of El Salvador here today, uh, Nayib Bukele, who I think spoke just a moment ago. And, and his, was that in English? It was phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know, I guess I, either I'm getting older or these leaders are keep getting younger. I used to be like the young person. <laughs> I used to be like the young person at all these meetings. Now you, you know, in Costa Rica and Colombia and El Salvador, they're all like 10 years younger. And, uh, and so, I, yeah, I think I am getting older, but, um, but it's an honor. Thank you for coming. I look forward to spending time with you later. And, I'm, and of course, I'm, I'm honored to join all you on the 49th Congress, the 49th. Uh, can't wait to see what you do for the 50th. It should be uh, probably open bar or something, right? <laughs> So I, I come here today because I remember <clears throat> during much of my time here talking about how we need to pay more attention to the Western Hemisphere was the equivalent of telling people you really should eat your vegetables. It, we, we knew it was the right thing to do, we knew it was good for everyone, but there were pressing matters all around the world. And for better, and in some cases for worse, uh, in terms of the cause of it, for the first time, certainly in my eight years here, but for the first time in a long time, the Western Hemisphere and events in the region are captivating uh, the headlines of our newspapers and attention to the press. And we'll talk about both the, the opportunities and the challenges of that time. I think it also helps, frankly, and to be fair, that this administration has made it a priority and did so from its earliest days. Uh, the visits of the Vice President to the region uh, just in the last three years and the visit to Secretary of State Pompeo and other high-ranking officials that have made visits to the region have been important. I've always cared about the Western Hemisphere because Florida, and particularly Miami, is one of the few places where foreign policy is a local government domestic issue. Um, and, and so it matters because so many lives have been impacted by it. So I guess, in my personal view, I have no choice but to care about what happens in the Western Hemisphere because I live in a community surrounded by people whose very lives and the path of their lives have been determined by outcomes and events that have happened in the region. And I also live in a community where a tremendous amount of jobs and prosperity is the result of the positive developments that are happening in the region. And, um, and so um, I'm very happy about that. Look, I think the challenges in the region are, are pretty straightforward. Some of them are, are old, and we continue to see them confronted in place after place. The, the battle against corruption and graft, uh, the violence which has driven so many people from their homes, particularly in, in parts of Central America, the drug trafficking, which undermines governments, communities, all across the, the routes in which they're moved across, and, and in some places, the lack of economic opportunity, fr frankly speaking, the lack of jobs uh, for, for, to fill those. Uh, a second challenge, of course, is one that's more global in its scope and nature, but one that I think will define these early years of this new century, and that is uh, the ongoing challenge posed to democracy by totalitarianism. And it comes in different forms. In some, it's just a straight up dictatorship. In others, it's the concept of managed democracy, which basically means, yes, we have elections, but none of my opponents can run. I control the media. And if I lose, the people counting the votes are on my side, so I win. And we've seen that play out in different parts of the world. It's a business model. And it is one, frankly, that totalitarians are marketing. Totalitarian regimes around the world are going to countries and saying, look at us. We have economic growth and we don't have protests, and we don't have internal debates. They do, but obviously the people who disagree with them are in exile or in, or in jail, but, or quiet for fear of exile or jail. And so there is an ongoing battle across the world between the concept of democracy and the concept of totalitarianism. And totalitarianism likes to tell the story. They like to show their economic growth, and they like to tell people, and we don't have any of these societal frictions that you have to put up with, because democracies require you to deal with other people, take other points of view in mind, come up with compromise. Democracy takes a long time, it's less efficient. But it is a serious challenge that we cannot take for granted. At the end of the Cold War, there was an assumption that everybody wanted to be democratic and our role was to support a, 
people in, in the difficult transition to democracy. We can no longer take that concept for granted, for totalitarians are challenging it, but also some have figured out a way to have the, um, the rituals of democracy, but not actually be a democracy. Of course, these challenges existed for a long period of time in Cuba, which as it transitions, uh, and I say transitions only in terms of the names changing, but it's trying to make permanent a totalitarian model and allow it to be accepted as an alternative form of democracy, I guess they like to call themselves, but they're not. In Nicaragua, where we've seen a direct challenge to those who disagree with, with a governing party and the use, uh, uh, one of the things that totalitarians around the world have perfected is the use of negotiations to buy time and exhaust the opposition. But obviously the, the headlines are, are captured by the catastrophe, for lack of a better term, that we now see in Venezuela. I do think that there are some things that are important for me as an American policymaker, and the first and foremost begins by making the argument to the American people about why should we care. Of course you should care about human rights violations, and we should care about humanitarian suffering, and we should care about defending democracy. Look, the totalitarians are always on the totalitarian side, and therefore the Democrats must also be on the Democrat side and work hard everywhere where that is challenged. But I would argue that just as a U.S. policymaker, but these are concerns that we believe we share with all the other democracies of the region. There are national security interests and national interests at play in what is emerging and Venezuela, and, and if I have one regret, is that we have not spent enough time in making that argument more consistently. It begins with something as serious, but as, as simple as an article last week in the New York Times, highlighting the links between a high level official in the Maduro regime and elements of Hezbollah. And this is a, one of the most corrupt regimes ever. And that's saying a lot, given the levels of corruption that we've seen around the world. Do not doubt for one moment that if someone shows up with enough money, a terrorist, and offers enough money, they will buy an official passport that is fake and allow a terrorist interested, if they, and perhaps have done so already, interested in traveling to do so under official documents, but under a false name. What about the 5,000 shoulder fired anti-aircraft uh, uh, man pad systems that the Venezuelan National Guards currently possess? You're telling me that for the right price they wouldn't sell one of them, much less 50 of them, to a narco-trafficking ring, to a terrorist organization? Someone told me that they don't worry, most of them don't work. My answer is only one of them has to work and you've got a real danger. What about the threat of mass migration? Colombia's feeling it, but other nations, Brazil, Peru, virtually every nation in South America is confronting this challenge. To begin with, it's destabilizing our partners. Look at, uh, I think the projections last year were that Colombia, which is engaged in a struggle of its own, trying to take on these groups that undermine the state through drug trafficking activities, spent last year, Colombia, over a billion dollars, about $1.2 billion, which is the cost of dealing, and by the way, they deserve a tremendous amount of credit for the way that Colombia has taken in these migrants from Venezuela and treated them uh, with such compassion. But, and, and other nations in the region have done so as well, but none has had more than Colombia. That's 1.3 million migrants at a cost of over a billion dollars a year. They also face the fact that there are FARC dissidents and ELE top leaders operating openly just across the border in Venezuelan territory, not just with the tolerance of the Maduro regime, with the cooperation and protection of the Maduro regime. So imagine if a well-armed, well-funded group is undermining a government from a nation that you are from, and the people doing it are just across the border and you cannot do anything about it because the government of that neighboring country is supporting them is protecting them. These are the challenges in the region, and, and they're real. How about the fact that for the first time in the better part of almost four decades, if not longer, we have seen an open invitation to a foreign power from outside this hemisphere to, at a minimum, place rotational military, if not permanent military presence in Venezuela in the way Maduro has invited the Russians. And in fact, they are there now. Um, how about the fact that foreign powers like China has helped the Venezuelan, the Maduro regime block the internet? Or the fact that both Russia and Iran are involved in offensive cyber and influence efforts. All this happening in our hemisphere. In our hemisphere. And if you believe that these things are contained in Venezuela, this model will be rep reproduced in other places. The model that these regimes have followed, particularly the Russians, 
is to directly undermine leaders and elections that they believe run counter to their interest. And for those that think that this is simply isolated for Venezuela, just wait until the next election somewhere in the hemisphere where someone Russia prefers is running for office and they get involved in influence operations and in hacking the electoral systems and in trying to undermine the results. This is a model that they are exporting. The Russians can no longer project power the way the old Soviet Union did. They have found a highly effective but cost-effective methodology to get involved. And one of the packages that they have in their suite of, of, of services they provide is offensive cyber capabilities and influence operations. What's most interesting, here's the challenge with not having paid attention to the Western Hemisphere in a long time. A lot of the people that write about the Western Hemisphere don't know anything about it. And I say that respectfully. They don't know anything about it. So they either compare it to something in the Middle East or they go back to the 1970s and 80s and 60s and ascribe attributes to a time that's long ago. And so they, they're not, to be, one of the great myths about Venezuela is that, that the regime is held together by some sort of ideology, anti-American ideology or anti-Western ideology. It's absurd. Are there a couple people, Maduro included, that would love to see, that want Venezuela to transition to a Cuban-style system? Yes. But the vast majority of these people, I would say, are too materialistic to be communists. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> they like to buy expensive things. This is not held together by ideology. That regime is held together primarily by two things, a desire to remain in power so that B, they can use that power to protect their families, their safety, and the millions of dollars that they have stolen. These are not wealthy people because they invented something. These are not wealthy people because they have a great business. These are not wealthy people because they're innovative or creative or great businessmen. These are wealthy people because they steal the money in, in the millions of dollars and they stashed it all over the world. That's what motivates them. And they don't stick with Maduro because they're loyal to him or loyal to some ideology. They stick with him because he allows them to keep that money, keep making that money, and protects their status. And if Maduro can't stay in power, then plan B is to protect that money, be able to keep it, because that is their parachute, their lifeline, to keep them out of jail and keep them from confronting um, to, uh, global justice for, for the crimes that they've committed. And I think there's, uh, now look, I, I do believe that their ability to do this has been hampered. And the sanctions that have been imposed that have, by the way, just kicking in, that's one of the things that's important to explain to everybody. These sanctions were put in place against sectors of that economy that were the lifeline of this corruption, and most of them had a grace period, meaning 60 to 90 days. It is only now starting to kick in, but the impact's already being felt. And some that think that these sanctions are the reason why Venezuela's economy is in total collapse, they were already in total collapse. Because the people that run these industries don't know anything about these industries. They know how to steal money. But they don't know how to run the oil industry. The people in charge of the oil industry aren't even good as generals, much less as oil executives. And none of them signed up to fight any wars. They signed up to steal. This is an organized crime ring. But the impact's already there. You know, I was reading or seeing just a couple days ago, three out of the four refineries today are basically, have, aren't operating. They have massive labor shortages. In fact, the workers, to the extent they're still left, people actually know how to do this stuff. The same is true for the electric grid, by the way. Um, no, it wasn't some cyber attack conducted out of the spare bedroom of my home using a... Uh, it was, frankly, it was incompetence. It's the fact that they haven't spent a penny on the maintenance. The fact that the equipment they're using in their electric grid in Venezuela, that's not even made any. You can't repair it because they don't make it anymore. Talking about 60, 70 billion dollars to rebuild it. And the people that know how to rebuild it are long gone. And, but even, even in the refineries, you've got employees at these places that are starving to death. They're stealing copper wire. They're stealing safety equipment. They're stealing pumps and compressors because they have to feed their families. And so the, the real challenge here is extraordinary. And so people ask what to do. I think the first thing we need to do first and foremost is recognize, and I had the opportunity this morning to speak to interim President Guaido. And I gotta tell you guys, I'm, we sometimes in democracies talk about how difficult it is to be in politics. In American politics, probably the worst thing that could happen to you is to lose an election. The second worst thing that could happen is to win one. No, I'm kidding. But, but the, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm joking. Is there press here? I was joking. <laughs> the second worst thing that could happen is somebody says nasty things about you, mean things, they tweeted something, a bad report. This, these people take to the streets every single day 
with no bodyguards, no serial killers standing on cars, openly exposed to someone taking a shot at them, knowing that they could be arrested any night, any day, at any moment. So the next time someone talks about a courageous political move, at least in the context of our domestic politics, I always remind ourselves of what Juan Guaido and so many others over there are undertaking. It is truly inspiring, and it should drive all of us to not take for granted how blessed we are, all of us respectively, to live in nations in which we are allowed to participate in a peaceful political process without fear of imprisonment, without fear of persecution, without fear of personal loss. But beyond that, I, I do think that one of the things we need to begin to do, if it's not ideological, if it's all about the money, then I, you, you go after a, a regime the way of this nature, the way you go after an organized crime ring. And that is, you go after their sources of what keeps them in the ring to begin with. And that's why I hope that we can get more partner nations around the world to participate in rev revoking the visas, for example, of their families. Because if you notice, most of these senior leaders, none of their families live in Venezuela. To them, it's this great country. They like to talk about how wonderful things are there and they're nothing. And I guess now they admit there's a humanitarian crisis after denying it for a long time. But none of their families live there. Padrino's family lives in Spain. Others' families are constantly traveling all over the world and enjoying the benefits and, and, and of, of the money their families have stolen. And if nations really want to do something about this, then revoke the visas of these people that are living off the stolen money stolen from the people of Venezuela. In particular, I don't mean, I don't know if they're here today, I don't mean to pick on them, but Spain has a lot of these visas. And, and, and you know, President Sanchez has the power to go after these visas, not to mention the millions of dollars stashed in those bank accounts. You have to go after this. It is the only thing these people will understand. It is the only reason why they are with this regime. And as long as they are allowed to travel freely and enjoy the millions of dollars that they have stolen, there is no reason for them to break from this regime. There is no reason for them to leave this criminal family that they've become a part of. I, I also think we have to target their funds, and, and, and their funds are still in banks. There are funds sitting in banks in countries that recognize President Guaido. Now, I understand every country has different laws about how you go after their accounts and so forth, but again, you need, we, if we really are truly serious about addressing this, the letters of support, the votes at the Lima Group and at the OAS are incredibly important and deeply appreciated. But we have to go after the bank accounts in these countries, and we know where they are. And I understand that the banks don't like it sometimes, but this is regionally important. And it is important for every nation to step up to the table and bring to it what they can to contribute to this cause and targeting the millions of dollars that they have stolen and stashed abroad is one of the things that they can do as well. On the U.S. side, we continue to work every single day to identify and punish those involved in the illegal gold trade. And when I mean illegal gold trade, I mean they are literally stealing the gold, which sounds almost like a pirate movie, but it's what they're doing. They are stealing the gold, not just from their reserves, but for, through illegal mining. One of the things that actually hasn't been covered enough is the incredible environmental destruction some of it irreversible that is taking place in Venezuela. Irreversible. The environmental destruction that's happening in this illegal mining. And then it's turned around and they sell it to Turkey and, of course, to our friends, the Russians. And it's important for us to... By the way, the Russians are involved in another scheme. The Rosneft, the company that basically they'll take in the oil from Venezuela, they'll resell it for them, take in the cash and send it back to them, in addition to the oil that they're getting on pennies on the dollar as part of the debt. All of it, by the way, belongs to the people of Venezuela. All of it being sold in the international marketplace simply to fund the thieves that stole it to begin with. There are a couple other points that I think we need to be getting creative about. I cannot emphasize enough how difficult it is for everyday people in Venezuela, especially outside of Caracas, not just to mention the opponents of Maduro, to even let people know what they're working on. Anytime, I can tell you when the internet's gonna go down in Venezuela when Juan Guaido is speaking. Every single time. By the way, with the help of the Chinese, irrefutable. The Chinese have helped them build this new version of a firewall and allows them to turn the internet off whenever they want and from it deny people access to social media platforms where they can see this. We have got to figure out a way to provide the people of Venezuela unfettered access to the internet and get around these tools. And I hope we can figure out a way to do that. I know we're working hard to find it. I, I also, um, now, you know, one of the things you'll hear efforts out there are whether, you know, the Russians' favorite vehicle, which would be this uh, Uruguay-Mexico-Montevideo process, um, or the UN contact group. I, we've been down this road before. Maduro has zero interest in negotiating 
a transition to a free and fair election. I'll tell you why. You know why Maduro's against a free and fair election? Because he can't win a free and fair election. He has no chance of winning a free and fair election. He will use negotiations to buy time. He will use negotiations to exhaust the opposition. He's done this over and over and over again, and he'll keep doing it. And I hope our UN partners, who I know are committed to this cause, understand that and are willing to move on it. Now, all that's the negative, the positive. Uh, my last point, and then I'll get back to the positive. I want there to be, <laughs> well, this is positive. This is positive. The, there, there is a serious rupture inside the regime. Now, I want everybody to understand that people think it's easy to break. No one wants to be the first pun to go. It's like, every, you know, like when you were in school and everybody says, you go, you do it, you go, it's like a dare. Then you step out, you look behind, no one moved with you. But the fear is extraordinary. These people are constantly monitored by Cuban and Russian intelligence. They know people that they have served with, that they went to the academy with, that they were best friends with, that are in jail and whose families have been suffering. The threat is not just to them, it's to everyone they love. They operate under a sentiment of fear, constantly, constantly. But if you want evidence of how insecure Maduro is about the people around him, and, and I would be insecure if my entire circle of advisors are thieves, liars, and criminals, but, but if, if you know how insecure he is, he spends his entire time touring military bases. If I'm secure about something, I don't spend my whole time focusing on it and pointing out to it. And so literally, this guy cannot leave a military base. And by the way, notice, when he goes to a military base, none of the soldiers have any weapons on him. Just an observation. But, but um, he can't leave a military base. And he spends all his time going to make me a mil military base, bring me people, put them in a uniform so that I can show the world that the military is with me. If the military is with him, he would have to spend all his time doing that. Here's where you know he's in trouble. Tell him to go into the street. Tell him to get in his car and drive out to a square somewhere in Caracas and talk to the people. He won't do that. He won't do that because he can't. And so he's in a lot of trouble. What he's facing there is not sustainable. And I remind everybody to two points. Number one, peaceful, civil disobedience movements lose every single battle except the last one. Except the last one. And there is not one you can point to that that's not the case. They lose every single battle. They go to jail. They put dogs on them. They, they, they put water cannons and pepper spray and tear gas and rubber bullets and real bullets. Civil disobedience movements that are, and peaceful dis, civil disobedience movements lose every single battle except the very last one. And this one will be no different. Remember, Maduro has to go undefeated. He can't lose a single battle. And he will lose, which reminds me of my final point on this, and that is the goal here is not just to get rid of Maduro. This is not about just Nicolás Maduro, because if you want a, another dictator, there are like seven or eight other people that would more than happy to be the next dictator. This is about transitioning to democracy, about restoring, helping the people of Venezuela restore constitutional order. And in that vein, let me remind everybody, this is not a US initiative. This is not something, an, an American initiative. This is an initiative of the people of Venezuela through their democratically elected National Assembly who is living out the letter and spirit of their constitution. And which side are we supposed to be on? What is the alternative to supporting this effort? To support Maduro? To turn a blind eye? We have no choice. We, not just the United States, but we as a region have no choice but to be on the side of the people of Venezuela and their democratic aspirations. Because as I said at the outset, the totalitarians always stick together. And so the Democrats must also stick together if we hope to win this battle between tyranny and freedom. Now the opportunities. The first is we have democracy in this region. And place after place, almost every month or every couple months brings a new election. Just had one in Panama. Before that in El Salvador, and in other regions later this year in Argentina. There is, these are now real democracies that are functioning. And some of them are con strongly contested elections, multi-party elections with sharp disagreements. But you should never take for granted that the celebration of every one of these elections further stabilizes and strengthens the democratic order. It creates a culture and a tradition that becomes harder and harder to break as the years go on. And we must celebrate that in virtually every country in this region, there is democracy and there are elections. And we have an opportunity to do something that the president pointed to 
uh, in his speech in Miami a few months ago, we have a chance for the Western Hemisphere to be truly the first free hemisphere in all of human history. We've got two or three places left to go, but just imagine that is a legacy of our time in public policy, to be able to say that we were able to be a part of having the first truly free hemisphere in the history of all of mankind. The second is economic growth despite significant global challenges. The trade disputes between the U.S. and China have hurt a lot of countries, but if you take Venezuela out of the picture and you're still carrying the anchor of places like Cuba and Bolivia and so forth, growth in the region writ large is going to be over 2%, which is higher than it was last year at about 1.1 to 1.5. But there are in, in individual countries. Brazil continues to climb out of recession. Chile, 3.2% growth. Peru, over 4%. Colombia projected to be around 3.5, 3.6. Central America writ large around 4%. Panama over 5, about 5%. South America minus Venezuela 2.4%. This is positive, especially if it can be sustained year on year. That's, this is the economic growth that creates prosperity and that is delivered to people and, and through jobs. The other thing that we should be excited about in this region is that corruption is a real issue. People are running elections. People are getting elected, not just on the promise of, of taking on corruption, but with real plans to do so. And this is extraordinary. This is one of the single biggest impediments to getting foreign investment. And, and, and to see it being tackled at, both at the ballot box and in the leadership level is something we should all be excited about. And the last thing that I'm very excited about is an emerging capability to take collective regional action on issues of importance. It was a long time since the OAS has been as invigorated as it's been in the last couple of years. The emergence of forums like the Lima Group. But it, 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 is in, it is bolstering, and we should be enthusiastic about the reality that today in this region, nations are coming together to work together. It's not an American initiative or a Canadian initiative. In fact, the United States isn't even a member of the Lima Group. It is neighboring countries collectively working together on issues of common importance. And we need to build on that, both in forums like the OAS and informal forums like the Lima Group. But the ability to work together is extraordinary and important for our future. And it is something we should commit to and encourage and empower. It, it is what I believe to be one of the great um, achievements that this administration has been able to do, and that is not to take over these initiatives or to step in and try to govern them and, and micromanage them, but to actually encourage and be supportive of in fact, the U.S. position on Venezuela is in support of the Lima Group. In support of the Lima Group. And so I think that this is something that I think bodes well for the future and something that we should continue to, to be a part of. My final point is what we're doing here, one of the things I intend to introduce here, working with Southern Command, is something modeled after the uh, a European initiative. And it's called, we call the Western Hemisphere National Security Initiative. And, and on it, we will continue to build upon some of the issues we've been doing together for a while. Humanitarian relief, the counter-drug efforts, uh, corruption efforts, mass migration, all the issues we've been doing for now, we will continue to work on those, and there are things we need to adjust in them in order to, to modernize it as those challenges evolve and move. But we also need to align new capacities to the realities, for example, that collectively we all have an interest in things like cyber warfare, we all have an interest in things like foreign powers trying to interfere in your domestic politics and in your democratic processes. We all have the growing threat of transnational crime, of international terrorism, and of course also looking at economic investment, at providing an opportunity for nations that are looking to develop to be able to avoid the debt trap that China has laid out for developing nation after developing nation around the world. So I look forward to introducing that initiative because it is something that I think could really provide a long-term framework for how the U.S. engages with partner nations. But what we should be most excited about and why I'm very excited about the future of this region, despite the challenges in places like Venezuela, is that we have increasingly capable and willing partners, nations that we are able to work together with. And the best model is to, I think there's a model in our hemisphere and a model internationally that I always look at. People don't realize that it wasn't that long ago, really, that South Korea's economy was smaller than North Korea's. The truth, smaller than North Korea's, it was a dictatorship, and it was a recipient of massive amounts of aid. Today, South Korea is one of the top 10 economies in the world. 
It's a stable and ongoing democracy. And it is no longer an aid recipient, but a donor. The other is the example of Colombia, which a lot of people think was an American initiative. It was not. The overwhelming majority of the money and almost all of the lives and blood and sweat and tears expended were those of the Colombian people. And we forget where Colombia was just a quarter century ago and where it has come so far, largely through their sacrifice and a little bit of help from the United States. And today, Colombia still faces challenges. But Colombia is also now capable of sending help to nations in Central America. They are now the ones training our partner nations in that region to tackle the challenges that Colombia faced not so long ago. And the good news is there are now over a dozen countries in the region that are on the precipice and the verge of doing that, and some are well beyond that. So it is an exciting time for the Western Hemisphere with some real challenges and some extraordinary opportunities. And I'm just uh, privileged and proud to be a part of it and to share these comments with you today. And thank you for having me. Thank you for the award. And uh, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you.